So welcome everyone, uh, thank you for joining. Some of you may have actually done this session before and those of you who don't know us, uh, we call Club Ortho. Uh, we are a, a teaching collaboration of orthopedic trainees and consultants and our aim is really just to uh, focus uh, on the undergraduate teaching because we all know uh, it wasn't really great. Uh, hopefully it's improved over time, uh, but uh, we started off about eight, nine years ago when things were pretty dire, uh, but now with the online resources, hopefully things have improved. So the aim of today's session is to cover a couple of things. So first of all, uh, shoulder examination, how to actually do it, how to actually do it well, and learn from somebody who does it day in, day out from their clinical uh, practice perspective. And secondly, just to learn about basic uh, shoulder pathology that you as medical students and those who are ACPs are expected to know really uh, from a very early stage. Um, we're not gonna go into the ins and outs uh, and minutiae of shoulder pathology, but just, just the broader topics really. So first of all, I'd like to introduce Mr. Arialis. Uh, he's one of our uh, shoulder and elbow consultants. I had the pleasure to work with in East Kent a few years back, uh, fantastic trainer, really, really good teacher. Uh, he's a only professor and also uh, is in charge of the undergraduate teaching at his trust. Um, so that's Mr. Ayalis for you. And secondly, we've got Andy Stone. So he's currently a post CCT Upper Limb Fellow. It's his second year as a fellow. We worked together last year and I'm lucky enough to work with him again this year. Um, he knows the shoulders well. He taught me shoulders for my FRCS examination. I'm sure he'll manage to teach well for the undergraduate level. So um, I'm going to pass this on to Andy. Thanks for that, Khaled. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm just going to hopefully share my screen with you. So, uh, da, 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 da. can you guys see, Khaled, you can see the presentation? Great. So, uh, examination of the shoulder, as uh, as I'm sure even my esteemed low limb colleagues will agree, it's the most exciting joint. It's uh, it's not a ball and socket per se, as as with a, a hip joint. It's more of a ball and a saucer, that makes it a very mobile joint. Gives us uh, the amount of mobility that we have in our shoulder. Can do lots of fancy things with it, uh, but it also makes it unstable. It's why it's uh, the most commonly dislocated joint. Uh, it's also an interesting joint because there's two two parts to it and uh, you've got the ball and socket the sort of whatever what sort of the layman would consider the shoulder uh, between the humerus and the, and the scapula uh, but then we've also got the scapulothoracic joint the, your actual scapula moving on your chest and um, between the two they make your shoulder shoulder movements so here we just got the the basic anatomy this isn't a, a sort of an anatomy session but i think it's important to go through that as it's key to every every examination uh the skeleton we'll, we'll sort of start off with i've brought my friendly skeleton here we've got the scapula that sits on the back of our thorax i'm going to a couple of points times today um mention the spine of the scapula with the supraspinous and infraspinous fossae below and that's an, an area that people don't necessarily sort of learn uh, then from the front as you can see on the slide we've got our clavicle we've got our scapula and we've got our humerus and those those together make up our our shoulder the the upper limb girdle and the shoulder joint You've then got a picture of a, a dislocated shoulder looking from inside. This is what you might see if you put an arthroscope, a camera into the shoulder. Um, uh, and you can see there's lots of important ligaments uh, that hold it in place. And really importantly, and this is one of the key bits that you need to know for, for your level is the rotator cuff. Um, people think of it as the rotators of the shoulder because it's called the rotator cuff. And it, it is, they, they, do, they do play an important part in rotating the shoulder. But their most important part is actually keeping the shoulder in joint. They all work together. It's like uh, it's like your fingers gripping a ball. They help to move it, but also hold it in place and keep it from sliding around all over the place. Keep it from from dislocating or from just not moving properly. So we know our structure for any examination. We start off with our introduction. Uh, we then go through our look, feel, move, and special tests. And what I'd quite like to add in there for you guys, if you can remember this, and uh, it's quite useful to remember this for all of your examinations, is look, feel, move, 
function in special tests. And that's important in the upper limb in particular. And you'll get that when you do hand exams as well. Um, if you can just show the examiner that you've got an appreciation of the function of the, the point of that joint, then uh, I think that'll get you extra points as well. Our special tests, I'll mention there are uh, a huge amount for the shoulder of, of varying accuracy. You don't need to know almost all of them. And um, once again, for you, it's really, you wanna be doing your rotator cuff tests, okay? Um, so we're gonna thank the patient, we're gonna complete our examination and present our examination findings as we always do. So I'm gonna come off of this for a moment and we'll come back to it. And I'm gonna just show you a, a video when we're doing an examination to run through it. Um, and then I'll go through it in a bit more detail. Welcome to your shoulder examination. Just like any examination, you want to start off by washing your hands, introducing yourself to the patient, asking for consent for the examination and asking them if they're in any pain anywhere. Finally, you're going to want to adequately expose and position your patient. For a shoulder examination, it's best to do this with both shoulders visible and the patient standing so you can view the shoulders from a number of angles. As with any orthopedic examination, we're going to want to follow the approach of look, feel, move, function, and special tests. But actually with the shoulder, it's best to start off with a quick screen of the neck, as there are lots of crossovers between neck and shoulder pathologies in terms of symptoms. And if you don't do it at the start of the examination, you'll likely forget. So I'll start with that. So if I could just ask you to try and touch your chin to your chest. Thank you. And if you could look up as high as you can, that's good, come down. Now look to your left, come back to the middle, look to your right, come back to the middle, try and touch your right ear to your right shoulder and the other way. Okay, so that, con that concludes the, the neck screening. You want to know if the patient gets any pain in their neck when they're doing that, particularly pain that radiates down to the shoulder. So now we're moving on to look. You're gonna to want to look at the patient from the front, from the side and from the back. You're looking for any scars, any swelling, any obvious deformity or asymmetry between the two upper limbs. Focusing in on muscles, you're going to want to look for wasting of the deltoid and also the supraspinatus in the supraspinous fossa above the spine of the scapula and then the infraspinatus below that. And in rotator cuff disease, you may well see really marked wasting and scalloping. Uh, you can, if, you, if you're able to and you remember to, ask the patient just to lift up their arm so you can have a look in the axilla for any scars, as that is a place that sometimes surgery is done. Thank you. So then moving on to feeling, you're going to want to start at the stellar joints, making your way outwards. You're going to want to watch the patient's face, looking for any pain. Moving out to the ACJ and then down the spine of the scapula. You want to feel into the muscles for any pain. And then finally, you can very gently roll the long head of biceps under your thumb, asking if there's any pain there. For movements of the shoulder, it's actually best to do this from behind the patient so you can watch the scapulae move as the patient moves their shoulder. Ideally, you would have the patient looking towards a mirror so you can watch their face at the same time. But it's important if you're unable to do that to make sure the patient knows to tell you if they're in any pain. And some patients will just grimace their way through it. If I could ask you to turn around, please. So if you show the patient what you want them to do, it's much easier than trying to explain to them what you want them to do. So if I could ask you to take both straight arms, both hands forward, 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 as far as you can go and back down and do that again for me. Going to want to watch the scapula here looking for any asymmetry between the two sides one more time and for any scapula winging thank you which is when the medial border of the scapula moves off of the chest wall as they move so if i keep you to do the same thing but this time with your hands out to the side as far as you can go keep going keep going and back down okay that's great so if i could get you with your left hand to place it as far up your back as you're able to you can measure this level versus a, an actual spinal level, or just quite simply whether they can get to thoracic spine, lumbar spine, sacrum. Thank you, and come down, and the same on the other side. Thank you, and come back down. For, 
next you do external rotation. So if I get you to put both of your elbows like that for me, and I want you to just keep your elbows tucked in at your side, but just bring your hands out as far as you can go. And you're gonna again, look for, a, look for asymmetry there in terms of how much you're feeling. Thank you, drop it down. Now, if a patient does not have a full active range of motion on one side, and you've got the supposed good side to compare to, you're gonna to want to see if they do have that passive range of motion. So is the shoulder too stiff to get to a range, or are they just say unable to do it themselves? So if we do that for external rotation, for example, I get used to go back into that position again. So if, the, if, if this side goes all the way out, and this side perhaps only goes to there, you're gonna to want to see and asking if they're in any pain, if you're able to take it out there or, and, or it just won't go there itself. Thank you. So if I get you to turn back round for me, uh, we're going to then be moving on to, to function and then finally special tests. So for function, we want to see just functional movements of the shoulder and whether the patient is able to do that. So the simplest way to do that is ask the patient if they can get their hand to their mouth and to the back of their head. Okay. Um, and then we want to move on to special tests. Now, there are a absolute myriad of special tests for the, for the shoulder in terms of what they're testing. But for, for your exams, you're going to want to be focusing on testing the rotator cuff and then a test for impingement. So there are four muscles of the rotator cuff, the supraspinatus, the subscapularis, the infraspinatus and the teres minor. And we'll test them in turn. So for supraspinatus, which is the top tendon and the most frequently injured, you're going to want to be testing abduction at a low level, but it's important that you bring the arm into the plane of the scapula. Now the plane of the scapula, if this is zero, straight across from the body, is about 30 degrees forward. So if you get the patient to bring the arms out about 30 degrees forward, you point your thumbs to the floor, this is called the empty can test, and takes the action of deltoid out of the picture to an extent, and get them to push up against you. Again, watching the patient's face. You're gonna to want to look for any pain, and you're gonna to want to feel for any weakness. For subscapularis, which is the front tendon, we can do the belly press test or Gerber's lift-off test. In the belly press test, you get the patient to put both hands on their tummy, move their elbows forward as far as they can go, keep the elbows where they are, and then ask them to resist you pulling the hand off the tummy. And test on both sides. Thank you. If you turn around for me, in Gerber's lift-off test, you get them to take one hand round to the back at about the sort of belt line level. You lift it away from and ask them, tell them that you're going to let go and can they stop it from falling back and hitting their body. You let go now. And you can also get them to push against you. Push up at my hand. Okay, come back down. So then we've got the two muscles at the, at the, at the, at the back, which are infraspinatus and teres minor. So for infraspinatus, you're going to get them to do the external rotation position again, except this time you're going to ask them to stop you resisting them. So keep your elbows where they are. Don't let me push your hands in. Okay. And if you feel that one is weak, you can focus in and really feel for muscle contraction at the same time. So if I just get you to do that same, just on this left-hand side again, you can just push against me and feel in the infraspinous fossa for the action of infraspinatus. Finally, Terry's minor, which is the hornblower sign. I get you to bring your arm out like this for me and just rotate up, put your hand to the ceiling. So if I get you to keep it there for me, some patients may not be able even to do this and it will just drop forward and that's the so-called hornblower sign. Or you can test it by getting them to push against you. So don't let me push your arm forward. You don't want to create a pivot point with your finger. And finally, for impingement, the most commonly used test is Hawkins' test, where you're trying to bring the greater tuberosity of the shoulder underneath the acromion. If I take your arm here, just fully relax for me, just let me take it. And again, you're going to be looking for pain. Thank you. So that concludes your examination. You want to finish by thanking the patient. Uh, and then asking for any bedside tests that you may want. And in general, in orthopedics, that's usually an x-ray, sometimes an ultrasound, and sometimes some blood. Okay, so just bring back up the presentation.
So introduction, there's lots of different ways of, of doing this. Just have some, some way that helps you in the stress of an exam to remember it. Commonly is, is wiper. So wash your hands, introduce yourself. Um, P, you could do double P, so patient details and, and permission, and also a triple P, pain. It's always good to ask them if they're in any pain anywhere. That helps you focus your examination and also perhaps might be the, the last thing that you examine. It's quite common, for example, when you do an abdominal exam for your, for your, for your student exams, that if they tell you they've got pain in the left iliac fossa, that's the last uh, quadrant that you prod. Um, exposure, make sure that they're adequately exposed and then reposition. And as I said, best to have both shoulders exposed and, and get them to move both at the same time and have them standing if they're able to. So on to look. Again, front, side and back, dependent on the amount of room that you're given in your little OSCE station, it may be easier for you to walk around the patient or for, to ask them to turn for you. And just as you're practicing, just get a feel for what you feel comfortable with. Um, so the way I remembered look is that you want to, especially when you're talking to your examiner, is say something for the skin, say something for the muscles, say something for the joints. So for the skin, it's scars. Um, for the muscles, it's, it's muscle bulk and wasting. And for the, uh, for the bones and joints, it's a, an obvious deformity or swelling. And that's true of any, of any joint examination. These are a few things that, that, you're, that you probably won't see in your exam, but that you may be shown a picture of. Um, so at the top here, you see where the clavicle is prominent at the, dis, at the distal end of it, so at the ACJ, and that's an ACJ dislocation. Um, in the middle, you can see an actual shoulder dislocation. The lateral border of the acromion is really obvious because that right shoulder has dislocated down. And finally, you can see a scar of a delta pectoral approach, which is probably the most common uh, approach around the shoulder, um, from a, certainly from an arthroplasty, from a joint replacement point of view, and also to an extent for trauma as well. Uh, and as I think, I think the middle one really shows you um, the importance of, of the fact that we've got two sides. We're lucky that we've got, an, in, most of the time in orthopedics, we've got a normal side to compare to. And quite often with uh, less obvious pathologies, you can use that other side to see what normal is. Moving on to feel. Um, always good to feel for temperature with the back of your hand first. Um, the shoulder is quite a deep joint. So even if you do get infection in the shoulder, it's often not that obvious, um, but it's still a good, good practice to do in your student exam. And if you show that with the back of your hand, that's quite good. Um, then, as I said, you want to feel from, from the sternoclavicular joint out along the clavicle, the chromioclavicular joints, the acromion itself, and then the, the muscles around the shoulder. So moving from the sternocavicular joint along, these are some of the some of the things that you will, uh, some of the areas that you'll probably, but that's really just a case of you knowing, knowing your sort of bony anatomy around the shoulder, really. This is quite an important one. Again, I, I warned you I'd go on about it a bit. The supraspinous fossa and the infraspinous fossa, either side of that spine of the scapula, that is sort of a key area where you may see wasting. And that's the sort of chronic condition that is actually a bit more likely to be, to be shown to you in, a, uh, uh, in an exam with a, a relatively elderly patient with some chronic cuff problems. So moving on to move. As I said, you want them to do active movements and then do the, pa do the passive if they don't have full active movements. Um, and I think it's worth just to show your examiner that you've considered active, that you've considered passive movements. If they do have a full active movement, just say that uh, I don't feel I need to do passive movements because they have got that. If you are doing passive movements or whilst they're, um, if they're stiff, it's good to feel for crepitus in the joint. That's a very non-specific sign that can be useful. It's very important to watch the scapula moving. Um, you can miss quite, quite a bit of pathology around the shoulder if you only examine from the front. Um, so you really want to see that moving, um, looking for winging of the scapula and just uh, it really tells you that the shoulder's moving well. Um, patients, if they've got a lot of problems within the ball and socket, uh, within the glenohumeral joint, they'll be really hitching their scapula, really sort of essentially shrugging to try and get their shoulder up. So this just gives an idea of what of what's a degree of normal, but everyone's different. For instance, the external rotation on here, not that many people can get quite that far out. 
um, an internal rotation you take inside. Um, this is quite useful for that one I was saying about that plane of the scapula. So if you look where the uh, if, if night that external rotation of 90 is zero in terms of the body, then you want to be bringing the arm forward 30 degrees of that for the cuff test that we shall come to. There's uh, theoretically people say that of your full 180 degree arc of abduction, about a third of it, so 60 degrees is glenohumeral movement, so ball and socket movement, and the other 120 is your scapulothoracic. The reality is if you stop the scapula moving, you do normally get more, you get almost 90 degrees of abduction in the glenohumeral joint, but in normal movement, um, it is a sort of 60 to 120 degree ratio. And that's full flexion for most people. What you will notice as well is that people will, ex well, you may notice is that people will externally rotate their, their hand, their arm, as they go into full abduction. And that just brings the greater tuberosity out from underneath the acromion. And if you try on yourself to keep your thumb pointed down and, and abduct your arm in full internal rotation, you'll find you can't get as far. This is a test that you can do, um, pushing against the wall for, and it just shows winging of the scapula, um, but it's probably beyond what, what you're necessarily expected to do at this stage. But if you do see winging of the scapula, what this is doing is testing serratus anterior, which is um, a muscle on the, outside, on, the, on the chest wall that controls the scapula. So special tests. So these are, our, we've been through these on the video, where these are the uh, test for your cuff and for impingement. So important to know your rotator cuff muscles the, and the innovation of them for your, for your written exams. Um, so you've got the subscapularis, which is the big muscle at the front. You can see it takes up the whole, for most of the whole of that undersurface of the scapula. Then at the back, you've got that spine of the scapula dividing it into the supraspinous fossa with the supraspinatus and then beneath the infraspinous fossa, which is mainly infraspinatus and then also teres minor there as well. It's just another view of your, of your cuff there. Um, and adding on in yellow, that's teres major, which is not part of the cuff, but is another muscle that goes from scapula to humerus. Um, I'm not going to go through these in great detail um, because we've, we've, we've kind of gone through that with the examination. Supraspinatus is important in initiation of abduction, infraspinatus and teres minor in external rotation and subscapularis in internal rotation. But, but as I said at the start, actually the main point of the rotator cuff is to hold that ball against the socket. And as your bigger muscles try and move it, they're doing the fine control and keeping it there and stopping it sliding around all over the place. So that's an example of your, of your empty can test that we, that we showed before. And again, see how the examiner has taken his arms forward about 30 degrees from that neutral position. That's your Gerber's liftoff test. And it's important to make sure that if the patient's in a lot of pain or can't internally rotate much, they might not be able to get to that position for you. Um, I think we're, we're probably moving into Hawkins test here um, as, as they bring over. Nears test is has been described in lots of different ways. Actually, the original description um, is stopping the shoulder blade moving, internally rotating the arm and abducting it right up into that shoulder blade. Um, but I recommend probably for you guys that Hawkins impingement test is, is better to do. So um, you want them to bring, get them to flex up to 90 and then you're gonna, get, you're gonna take control of the shoulder and internally rotate to bring that greater tuberosity under the acromion and potentially inflame the bursa or potentially irritate the inflamed bursa. So as always at the end, make sure you thank the, impatient, thank the patient, complete the examination. Actually, one thing that isn't in this presentation that I did mention earlier is that next screen. Um, I think it's just best to do it at the start um, just because I, will, I always forget if I don't do it right at the start. Um, if, if it's easier for you, you can just remember that to complete any orthopedic exam, you, you always at least say that you'd like to examine the joint above and below. Um, 
you're going to want to complete your examination with a full new you'll say a full neurovascular examination um, so you're going to want to test for the pulse cap refill and all the sensory and motor modalities of the upper limb but in reality you'll just be saying that for your exam you won't be expected to do it but there are points for this you're going to then want to present your examination findings um, so if you've been taking a history as well things like handedness and job sports are really important for upper limb um, and it's important just these little things you get points for so just make sure you do them so these are the uh, some common shoulder pathologies um, that you might find in your um, find in your examination um, I'm not going to go into them in any detail because uh, Mr Arialis is kind enough to be speaking to us next about shoulder pathologies um, and so I'm sure they will uh, they will come up Okay, uh, thank you. And if uh, if you have any questions, please just I don't know, Khalid, are we getting them to ask them or add them to a chat? Yeah, I think I think this is a good point where any questions regarding the examination can be asked. What's necessary? What's not necessary? What's expected? What's not? Any clarification you'd like to seek with regards to how to do the examination? You can ask questions now. You can put your speaker on, come on camera, raise your hand, whatever you want to do. And just to let you know, we will be putting the video on the uh, Collab Ortho website as well. Is that right, Khaled? That's right, yes. So we'll have a content section soon, which will have all these videos on. So I'm going to stop sharing so I can see you guys. So I think it seems like everyone's happy with... Uh... Stunned silence as is often the way. Uh, here we go. Here's, so if you rush for time, most important special test to do, um, your, I'd say do your cuff. Um, if, you do, uh, if you do the empty can, do your infraspinatus, your teres minor, and your um, uh, subscapularis, just one test for that, then, uh, then, then that, that should be, I would suggest at a medical student level, but that's enough. To be honest, if you're getting really slick, you can do that and you want to save some time, you can do those during your movement. So, for instance, when you get them to do that external rotation position, you can test infraspinatus. But to be honest, for you guys, I think it's it's better to just to have that look, feel, move, function, special tests. Um, just to stop, you know, exams are stressful um, and it just keeps it keeps it there. Um, so in terms of anterior and posterior draw tests um, are... So they are important tests for me as a shoulder surgeon, but uh, uh, the reality is they're quite difficult to do. Um, they're going to cause pain to a patient or at least apprehension. So I think it's the sort of thing that you just want to know about. Uh, if, if, you're, if you have got a young patient with sort of a history of instability that you're examining them, um, probably um, at the apprehension test if you did want to do one test which is just your sort of it so the people tend to dislocate in this position uh, so the sort of superman position um so just bringing the arm up and gently externally rotating and asking if they get a feeling that they're going to dislocate um but again I, I really don't think you're going to be expected to to do that it's uh, it's a difficult it's a difficult test to do properly there are lots of different components to it um i would suggest that um for you guys just saying that uh, if, if it was a young patient with a history of instability, I'd want to do tests for instability is probably enough. Um, and certainly I don't think you need to do it as well. Um, generally in shoulders, you, by the time you move on to the examination, you've got you kind of got in your head, this is a sort of middle-aged to elderly patient, I'm doing degenerative type tests, or this is a young patient, I'm doing instability type tests. Um, so you certainly don't have to do those as well. And just, just to clarify one thing, so in med school, so especially the med school OSCEs, if you manage to do look, feel, move well, then special test is just a massive bonus. And as one of my previous consultants said, special tests are for special students. <laughs> if you, you know, if you think you're gifted and you're going to be hitting those, you know, distinctions and merits, and by all means do, then you need to be super slick on your basics and then you can fit in the special test, you know. So, so, so yeah, do learn them, uh, but don't get too bogged down on trying to fit them in and rush. Yeah, them in a bit and don't forget, please don't don't lose out on those points for washing your hands, for introducing yourself, for checking who the patient are. It is incredible 
how many points you get for that. And it's incredible how many people forget to do it. And again, it's the stress of the exam. Have an algorithm, have a, a mnemonic in your head to do it. Don't like, just keep that. Like don't, don't deviate from that really boring thing. And every time you're practicing, do that. Just drill it into yourself because it's, it's, it's easy money. It's easy points for you. And I'd say it's probably one of the easiest exams to do with your fellow colleagues because it's an upper limb exam. You don't need a room. You don't need a couch. You don't need to undress them. Just, just all about getting the shoulder movements right. Just getting slick at it, doing it from the front side back, and you know the bits that Andy did. Right. Okay. Unless there's any further questions, what we will do at this stage, we will move on to the second part of this talk, which is talking about shoulder pathology, which Mr. Arialis has kindly prepared. Um, a small presentation for you guys. So I'm going to make Mr. Arialis a host and then he can start sharing his screen. So while you do that, I definitely have to emphasize what you said. Everybody can even forget about, about my presentation. This is uh, to put things into context and to understand why we do all those tests, but uh, it's not the essential part of the of the OSCEs. I mean, if you introduce yourselves and you behave as you should with all the look, feel, move, uh, then they will not expect from you to distinguish uh, all the solar pathologies. It's good to have a general idea, and the presentation will be in our, on our website, so if you wanted to go back and just look into things, that's nice but you don't have to remember all those things I will be talking about, definitely. Right, Mr. Ayers, you, you are host now. Okay. So you can start. So can we see this, Khalid? Um, yes, so it's projecting well. Okay. So we'll be going through, it's exactly the same slide you saw before. The, the most uh, common problems you may encounter in the clinical practice, not in too much detail. Uh, and this puts into context what we talked uh, previously, all those tests and examinations, why we do them, and what actually happens in a clinical scenario. So the first and most uh, simple thing to examine is range of movement. And uh, the interesting thing is if you have someone that is uh, neurologically intact and cannot externally rotate, then it's quite fast to identify what the problem is. The clinical presentation will be someone like on the, on the picture here that it's locked in internal rotation. And this can either be frozen shoulder, posterior dislocation or arthritis. So if you take an X-ray, and you see the bottom images, this is arthritis, that's why they can't extend rotate. If you see the image on the middle, then this is a locked posterior dislocation. Image on the right, it's a frozen shoulder adhesive capsulitis, and that's why they cannot extend rotate. So you can actually have the, your diagnosis with just one test and one x-ray. So what is adhesive capsulitis? This is a reaction of the, of the shoulder capsule that has as a result uh, loss of range of movement. And because it's an inflammatory process, uh, also significant pain and inflammation it goes in three stages. So initially the joint reacts and creates um, a painful freezing stage. Then the pain settles down slowly, but the uh, loss of movement stays there. And then there's a final thawing phase, which is the interesting thing is it can be up to two years. So this takes quite a long time to settle down. The pain goes away. The movement slowly come back, comes back, but it comes back very slowly. The cause, quite often it's primary. Primary means we don't really know why it happens. Uh, there are lots of uh, theories, but there's no specific uh, uh, answer to that. Secondary, it can be the result of something that already happened in the area. Uh, it can either be a systemic problem very common in diabetic uh, or patients that have metabolic problems. 
it can be an extrinsic factor. So uh, some kind of neurological disease or uh, cervical spine problems or intrinsic factor problems inside the joint uh, where that make the joint react and become inflamed. And a very common cause can be injury or surgery. The joint reacts because of the attack, becomes inflamed, the capsule becomes uh, shrunk and you lose the movement. And this is very similar to what you would be seeing if you were to dissect uh, the shoulder joint. You would be seeing the capsule inflamed, red and very thick. This is more common in women of older age, diabetic, and when it happens on one side, there's a higher incidence of happening on the other side, and it can be bilateral. So up to 14%, it can be bilateral. The presentation, it starts with pain uh, that is worsened or increased with movement. The movement is less and the loss is global. So all the range of movement you saw before would be less than what you would expect. And there's pain in all movements when you try to examine the joint. And the onset is an older age, as we said before, prevalence is in older patients, not younger ones. The X-ray is to exclude the other causes, like we said at the beginning. So exclude arthritis or exclude the posterior lock to dislocation. And the MRI can show a, this scar tissue inside the joint. This is an MRI scan before and after the treatment, by the way. And this is where the treatment has stored the scar tissue to allow movement to restart. Physical examination, the more characteristic thing is loss of external rotation. This is uh, the most common finding and global loss of range of movement. All the provocative tests that you, uh, we talked about before could be positive because this is a very painful joint. So they're not really very useful uh, to, to try and do. So you don't have to make your patient extremely painful to try and confirm that um, this is the diagnosis. It's mainly pain, loss of movement with pretty much normal X-ray and other imaging. The treatment is initially and most of the times can be only conservative. Uh, you can add steroid injections. This is uh, only at the painful phase to reduce the inflammatory response. If the patient has gone into the frozen or is in the thawing phase, the steroid doesn't do anything. In fact, it can cause problems because it creates another invasion into the joint. Uh, the only problem is uh, that you might need to wait a very long period of time for conservative treatment alone to work. There is something in the middle between surgery and conservative, which is called hydrodilatation. This is injecting into the joint a very large volume of uh, saline or local anesthetic. Uh, there is no clear guidelines whether this uh, actually works. Uh, so the golden standard for something like this, if conservative treatment fails, is a manipulation under anesthetic, where we take the patient, we put him under the anesthetic and we move the shoulder joint around to tear the scar tissue. Sometimes we may need to go inside and do a capsular release. This means actually going inside with uh, instruments and removing all of the scar tissue around the joint to allow the joint to move again. And then we'll go to the most common problem you may encounter in uh, shoulder surgery. And this is subacromial impingement and tendonitis. Impingement on its own, it's not an actual uh, diagnosis. It's, it's simply a mechanism. What happens and why is the joint painful? What happens is the tendons inside the joint rub on a bony prominence or soft tissue, and this creates pain. So a more uh, uh, appropriate term would be a subacromial pain syndrome, which describes what happens uh, in the joint, rubbing of the tendons inside the joint and not pain coming into the joint from somewhere outside. So there are two main kinds of impingement. You have external and internal impingement. External means impingement outside the actual glenohumeral joint and can be primary or secondary. Primary, again, means that uh, there is a nostophyte, a bony prominence, uh, something that actually reduces the volume of the subacromial space or 
and increase the thickness of the tendon. If the tendon gets inflamed, it becomes thicker, and then it, there is not enough space for the tendon to move in the subacromial space. Secondary means that the humeral head moves in a strange way. So the space is enough, but the humeral head lifts upwards and the patient has lost the control of the humeral head or of the, or the scapula. This is more of a mechanical uh, uh, issue, not a direct um, bony problem. And this is only controlled by physiotherapy. This is common in younger patients and the pain is isolated most often anteriorly, and it's usually uh, relating to the activities that they do. And they have internal impingement. This is extremely uncommon. I will not go into depth into that. It's uh, common in uh, overhead throwers. So they're always young athletes that participate in uh, sports that involve throwing. And the impingement is inside the glenohumeral joint, not outside under the acromion. So it accounts for almost two thirds of shoulder pain. And as we grow older, the chance of having a problem like that increase with the peak incidence around the sixth decade. So a lot of the patients that come to the clinic are middle-aged or older. Factors that can increase the risk of having this problem is the actual tendon uh, histology the age, as we said, and the genetics. So the design or the, the way the actual joint is, uh, is created, the shape of the acromion, the shape of the joint can affect the potential of developing this problem. And then extrinsic factor is control of the humeral head that may again lead the humeral head escaping superiorly and cutting or pinching under the acromion. The clinical presentation is usually pain without any known uh, uh, preceding trauma. The patient has a characteristic pain on abduction that starts from around 60 degrees and goes all the way to up to 120. So they start without pain, they start becoming painful, and then the pain stops as soon as the arm goes above their head. And this is the area where the tendon of the supraspinatus catches or rubs against the acromion. Sometimes this pathology can also cause uh, loss of internal rotation. This is not a frozen shoulder. This is reaction of the joint capsule to the impingement. And the treatment of this pathology is completely different from a frozen shoulder. And the loss of rotation is mainly when the arm is abduction, you see there's no internal rotation that the patient should have. And you need to look for this specifically to be able to find it. Physical examination is all the tests we already talked about. The problem is that none of the tests alone is very specific for this, uh, for this pathology. Uh, but if you do them in clusters and you do at least uh, three or four of those and they are all positive, you have a higher chance of uh, identifying a patient that has subacromial impingement. X-rays are useful because you can identify the bony spurs. We can identify problems with the AC joint. You can look at the acromion, even though not always the acromion is the problem. And you can also see if there are any other issues, especially if there's a calcific deposit that reduces the volume of the joint even more, or can be the result of chronic impingement. MRI and ultrasound are useful mainly to exclude problems with uh, the calf tendons and confirm that this is more a case of impingement or cutting of the tendons and not a tendon tear. The treatment depends on the age, but it's generally conservative. Rarely surgery is indicated for patients that have pure subacromial impingement. Uh, you can uh, start with uh, simple physiotherapy, control the position of the scapula and the glenohumeral joint and not steroid injections uh, in order to reduce the inflammation and the thickness of the tendon. If we need to proceed with surgery, uh, usually we do three things all together. We resect the bursa under the acromion, which you can see here. Then we resect uh, the spare, if we identify a bony spare, and we resect the anterior part of the uh, acromion. And this increases the space and allows the tendon to move more freely and stops all the rubbing of the top surface of the tendon at the bottom of the acromion. And this is the next step of most likely a similar pathology. So if the tendon rubs for too long, 
you can end up with a tunnel that is torn because of the constant degeneration. The most common tendon affected is the supraspinatus, but you can have tears extending backwards to the infraspinatus. The more tendons are torn, the more complex the repair and uh, the worse the outcome and the results. The types, there are two main types. One is an acute tear. This happens when the tendon is already injured and the patient has a fall or has uh, any kind of acute uh, movement, or it can be the result of the dislocation. And then you have degenerative tears. Most of the tears that come into the clinic are degenerative tears that are the result of either repetitive movement, sporting injury, like swimming, things that, again, have repetitive overhead activities, reduced blood supply that happens in older patients. Patients that have the bone spares, the impingement that we talked previously, can end with a tendon that is torn if you have a continuous rubbing of that tendon. It's quite common in older patients, and risk factors is age, smoking, hypercholesterolemia, and a family history. The diagnosis, again, is clinical, together with all the tests that are similar to the tests we perform for the impingement. The main difference from the impingement is the weakness. So the patients that have a cuff there are weak, especially when you try the uh, tendon tests. And you need to test all of the tendons. You need to test the subscapularis, you need to test the supraenefraspinatus, and you need to test the teres minor. Those three tests are important to identify how many tendons are torn and uh, how big a tear you potentially have to face. Another characteristic is that the patient may have uh, no or very limited active range of motion, but when you help them and you do the movement from them, so passive range of motion can be almost full. And this is a very characteristic of a calf tear. So a painful shoulder, especially at night, that is weak and has reduced active but almost full passive range of movement is most likely a shoulder that has a calf tear. X-rays are useful because you can see a proximal migration of the humeral head, but the most diagnostic tool is the MRI scan that can identify the shape, the size of the tear, the uh, muscles that are around the joint, but be careful because a patient that has a cuff tear in a scan doesn't necessarily mean this is a patient that needs treatment of any kind because it's quite common up to one in two patients after the age of 60 may have a cuff tear or a partial cuff tear when you uh, see their MRI scans uh, of the shoulder. Ultrasound is also very useful, but it depends very much on the user. It has two small issues. It cannot uh, identify any more any other problems other than the tendons, and it cannot give you any idea about the um, condition or the pathology of the muscles around the joint that move the tendons. So this is a characteristic MRI scan. You see on the left side, it's an intact tendon in continuation. And on the right side, you see this white bit that is fluid and the tendon has stopped. There's no continuation from the tendon muscles down to the GT. And these again are scans of uh, where stairs retracted either around the level or a little bit more lateral to the glenoid. The further away from the glenoid the tendon is, the worse the tear and the less likelihood of being able to repair it, especially if the patient is older and has bad quality tissue. The treatment, the first line of treatment is often physiotherapy, uh, where you allow for a short period of rest, and then you start working with the um, uh, uh, physiotherapist on the TOBE protocol to improve the deltoid function. But if the patient fails to make adequate recovery, especially in function, then you need to treat them surgically. Uh, young patients with an acute calf tear are better treated with uh, immediate repair, not waiting for physiotherapy. So the the first step physiotherapy is only in older patients with a degenerative calf tear, which is again, the most common scenario in the clinic. Now the surgery, uh, you can just debride the area. And this is again, only for older patients. The most common scenario is to do a rotator calf repair. If the tendons are non-repairable, then you can either move another tendon in the area or you can use a patch to repair the tendon that has not uh, been uh, repaired, or you can do a technique where you 
try to push the tendon down by using a patch at the top of the, of the humerus. For all the patients, you can go straight to a reverse solar arthroplasty, especially if they're older than 75 with a massive calf there retracted like the one we saw before. I won't go into details in any of those treatments, but remember for younger patients, the best thing is to repair the torn tendon, pull it back and stitch it where it left from. For older patients with a massive retracted calf there, you go straight away to a reverse solar arthroplasty. And now we'll uh, go into uh, one more problem, which is instability. This is when the joint is, is loose. And there are two main groups of instability. One is the patient is born normal, has a traumatic incident, and then after that, the joint becomes uh, loose or unstable. In those patients, usually the dislocation is unidirectional. Most often anterior, it can be inferior or posterior, but it's in one direction. And there is a lesion we call a bunkard lesion, which means that the labrum inside the joint is detached. And quite often you need to operate on those patients. The other way is a multidirectional traumatic instability. This means that the patient is born loose, is born with a loose joint. And for those patients, the best treatment is rehabilitation with specific physiotherapy. When we assess a patient with a dislocation, we need to answer those five questions. When did this happen? Is this an acute, chronic? Is it recurrent? How many dislocations? How did it happen? Is it traumatic or traumatic or voluntary? Which direction, anterior, posterior, or multidirectional? Is it fully dislocated or is the joint just relaxing? And then the main thing is, is it someone that was torn or is it someone that was born with a loose joint? And then we need to find out how the, what the condition of the bone and what the actual pace in front of us uh, in form of, of expectation activities is. And this will give us a rough estimate of what we need to do to treat those patients. The clinical assessment, on top of the apprehension we already talked about in the relocation test, we are adding two more things in those patients. One is a sulco sign. The sulco sign is very characteristic for patients that have uh, multidirectional instability, patients that have loose joints. And then we can do the load and shift test, which is we actually try to push the humeral head in front and see whether it dislocates. And if this happens, then we can assess how much it dislocates. And this will give you an assessment on how loose the joint is and whether uh, this is something that will require surgery. This is not a very comfortable uh, test to do. It could be quite painful. So sometimes we only do the apprehension, especially patients that are chronic dislocators. Those two tests, the load and shift and sulcus are more useful in multidirectional instabilities. And when you treat anyone with a dislocation, you need to do the Byton score. You need to see how lax they are in general because it changes dramatically the outcome of any surgical procedures we do. And the Byton score is calculated by adding how many of those things the patient can do. If they can flex the little finger, flex the thumb back, they get two points for each one of those two. If they can hyperextend the elbows or the knees, two points for each one because we have two knees and two elbows, and get one point for being able to lean forward and put both palms on the floor. So the total for the bite on score is a nine. Investigations, you need an x-ray. You can see how, if it's an acute dislocation, the humor head lies in front of the glenoid. That's a normal joint. And when you have chronic conditions, you need scans. This is a chronic posterior dislocation. So the head is looking backwards. And this is an anterior dislocation that is reduced, but this is what we call the bunk at lesion. This means the front of the labrum is detached. So if you compare to the back, you see the back, the labrum is attached and there's no white sign, whereas the front is detached. And the best imaging modality to get those pictures is an MRI arthrogram. Arthrogram means we inject dye into the joint and then the dye goes all around where there's space and will give you the exact delimination of all the anatomical structures. What happens if you dislocate for the first time? There's a totally different response of the body depending on whether you're young or older. So patients that are younger than 18, adolescents, they have almost 100% chances of redislocation. They need extra careful and extra care when you treat those patients to decide whether you proceed with surgery, but it's very likely that they will need surgery. 
when you go older than 18, the older you go towards 30, the less chance of very dislocation. And if you get older than 30, the dislocation rate is really low, but then you have an increased rate of um, calf problems or calf tears that are traumatic and need, again, urgent attention. If you go to the very old group, older than 60, then you can most likely treat everything conservatively. So the non-operative treatment is almost for everyone after a first dislocation, apart from adolescents. They belong in a very specific group and you need to be very careful when you treat those patients. Uh, the most common protocol you need to use is a DABI protocol. This is a very specific protocol that goes to phases and allows rehabilitation after the initial immobilization period. And immobilization does not have to be prolonged. About a week to reduce the initial painful stages enough for injuries like this. And if, then if they fail conservative treatment, especially if they're young, athletes with uh, recurrent dislocations, then you need to fix uh, their tear. The most common treatment is a bunk at uh, repair where you put three anchors in the front of the joint, like you see here, and you reduce the labrum, that's the labrum at the front of the joint, back to the glenoid where it was detached from. The last thing we talk about is osteoarthritis of the sole. This is exactly the same as osteoarthritis in any other joint. The only difference is that is in the shoulder. So, um, all the findings, all the treatment, all the, the rest are pretty much the same. Uh, it's more common in older women, older than the age of uh, 60. And it can be primary, so we don't know exactly what the cause is, or secondary. Secondary means there's something happened and then the shoulder had to develop arthritis. The most common reason is rotator cuff arthropathy, like you see on this X-ray. So the, tendon, the rotator tendons are gone. The humeral head slowly progresses to um, sublux superiorly. It drops on the acromion and develops arthritis. Trauma, dislocation, inflammatory, osteonecrosis, or neuropathic, they're all causes, again, of arthritis as they damage the cartilage of the joint. The clinical presentation, again, is quite characteristic. It's one of the causes of loss of external rotation, which is a very common sign. Pain and pain that stays there even when they are sleeping. And a slow progression of all those symptoms. So nothing is a sudden. The patients usually have a long history of pain that progresses and becomes worse. Loss of movement that progresses and becomes worse. And one characteristic thing on the feeling of the joint is that it can feel crepitous. It's almost like you're walking on snow. X-rays are essential for the diagnosis of this uh, pathology because you can see the same findings as with all the other arthritic joints. So uh, osteophytes, uh, contrast uh, sclerosis, cysts, uh, uh, loss of the cartilage, everything is obvious on the X-ray. One thing you need to look out for the, on the X-ray is whether the space between the humeral head and the acromion is preserved. If that is preserved, then it's most likely primary. If the space is lost, then it's most likely the result of a calf there. And the reason this is important is because you treat them differently, you use a different joint replacement. And this is how it would look if you decided to do a CD scan or an MRI. Both are useful for your preoperative planning and also to identify whether the calf tendons are intact because it changes what treatment you will give them if you decide to do a joint replacement. So the treatment, you always start with a conservative treatment, manage the pain, uh, work with the physiotherapist to get as much and maintain as much movement as you can. And when the conservative options fail, then you need to discuss surgery with uh, the patient. So the non-operative treatment is optimization of uh, analgesia. Use the TOBE protocol to uh, work on the calf, uh, on the muscles, and especially the deltoid muscles. You can do steroid injections. Uh, corticosteroid injection is the most common. Usually you limit this to one injection to assess whether this uh, gives a long-term uh, improvement of symptoms. You try to avoid a lot of steroid injections if you plan for surgery. There's no clear link with uh, infection or other issues, but it's best uh, to avoid the small chance of introducing a bug into the joint. Hyaluronic acid and biologics like PRP 
There is no clear evidence whether they help and they're not uh, advocated by the NICE guidelines. You can use biologics, especially PRP, in patients that you uh, think they will not uh, tolerate surgery, patients that are too sick to go ahead with surgery or uh, patients that don't want to have surgery uh, because it is uh, slightly less harmful to the calf tendons if you ever decided to do a joint replacement. And the DMARDs are for patients with rheumatoid arthritis because they can significantly improve the pain and reduce the progression of the rheumatoid arthritis uh, into the joint. The operative treatment, you have two kinds of joint replacements, and this is the mainstay of the treatment. You can do an anatomic if the calf tendons are intact, or a reverse where you put the ball on the scapula in case the calf tendons are not intact. For young patients, you can try what is called an arthroscopic uh, comprehensive uh, management. Uh, this is a, a technique where you remove some of the osteophytes, you try to debride areas of pain, and you try to um, delay the inevitable of a joint replacement. And after this, this is only for patients that have uh, infection, they have uh, previous failed procedures, or uh, they have a limited function in the joint but are extremely painful. So there's a very, very limited population for something like that in uh, solar arthritis. And this is where I will end my presentation and, and stop sharing. And you can ask any questions or anything you would like. All right, so it's time for any questions. I know what I said, I said a lot of things. Everything will be in, uh, in the website. If you think of anything or if you'd like to discuss anything, happy to send us an email and uh, I'll reply into that because uh, especially all of those uh, all of those procedures and all of those pathologies can be confusing. And focus on the first part of the entire lecture. That's where all the questions you will most likely get will be from. The second part is quite useful when you are doing your MCQs. And, you know, if you are that special student who's done the special test and has got themselves a lot of time to talk about things. Um, but just, I mean, when I was a medical student, I remember trying to simplify shoulders. And the way I remembered it was, it's either going to be stiff, painful or unstable. Yep. And really, that's what it all comes down to. If it's unstable, you know the problem is somewhere around the dislocation side of things. Okay, and if it's stiff and painful, the stiffness and pain is either coming from the bone, it's either coming from the actual joint, the cartilage, or the tendons around it. And that's just how you simplify things, and then you can sort of structure your thoughts there with anything. So whether we're talking about the rotator cuff, whether we're talking about instability, whether we're talking about arthritis, the treatment protocol is fairly similar. So you still have to do the whole history, clinical examination, imaging, and then after imaging, then it comes down to non-operative and operative treatment. Non-operative treatment is going to be optimize analgesia and restore movement, and that can either be done by giving them a set of exercises or actually forming your brain into physio. And then it's slightly the medical side of things, whether you give them analgesia, it may be an injection for pain and stiffness. And the last thing is surgical. And if somebody's asking you what kind of operation is the right operation for this patient, I mean, you are absolutely smashing that exam. So definitely, yes. Yeah. So exactly, you know, at the end of the day, don't get too bogged down. Again, this is all for your information. And you can take the snippets out of it that benefit you the most. Um, as we mentioned, we will upload all this content up on our website and you'll have easy access onto those things. Right, okay, um, I think if there's no further questions, then uh, at this stage, we'd like to say bye. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Arialis, and thank you, Andy. Thank you all, thank you all. Yeah, thanks for coming, guys. And, um, and thank you all for attending. Um, 
So the question is, do you know when the next session is? Uh, we will keep you posted. So just follow our um, Instagram page. And also we have a brand new website called collabortho.org. It's quite easy to access. Um, yeah, so our Insta is also collabortho. So if you just uh, search for collabortho uh, in Instagram, you'll easily uh, be able to follow us. And everything's updated there and our website. Right, looking forward to seeing you all again. Um, thanks for now and good night, everyone.